Hey guys, welcome to the Big Liberty Show. Very, very important show today. Um, as we look at a topic which I think very few of us are engaging on in a very meaningful way, also to an extent a lot of us don't understand what's going on, given the jargon, the economic jargon that we are bombarded with on this topic. Um, today I've got a special guest as we look at the issue of prescribed assets um, and maybe just other economic issues too, just to keep us in the loop and abreast with um, you know what's happening. Um, as I said, special guest today, Mike Schussler. He is a renowned economist in this country, um, heads up a small consultancy firm. I shouldn't say small, does quite a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, a very um, authoritative voice on economic data in this country and really just economic issues, period. Mike, welcome to the Big Liberty Show. It's such a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Awesome. Um, Mike, <clears throat> I'm going to jump straight into it. Um, South Africans right now are scared. There's a lot of messaging going out that is confusing, that is jargon laden, um, and essentially conceals reality mm. to a lot of, for a lot of people. Now, Without me going, you know, too broad, let's let's narrow it down to I think what we want to discuss here today, which is you know our pensions, our savings as South Africans. Mm. Um, talk to us about South African saving rates and our pensions overall. How big are they? Okay, look, our savings rate is very very low as a country, but savings and economics measures what's left after you've spent things, and when we put money into a pension. It's called an investment and therefore it is spending. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a misdemeanor offense of most economists when we talk about savings. We should be talking about the broader range of savings. Mm. And South Africa has one of the largest pension fund pots in the world. Mm. It used to be about eighth biggest. It's now dropped back a bit, more so because the Brazilian uh, reforms have come in mm -hmm. and other countries and so on. Uh, but we're about 11th biggest now um, in the world in uh, dollar terms. Mm -hmm. um, we're about sixth biggest in GDP terms in the world. Um, it's probably one of the biggest assets uh, that the world has seen uh, because without the sort of pensions around the world, mm. we would have not seen many companies come forward and build. These institutional investors, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. are mainly driven by pension funds. Mm. And in South Africa, we wouldn't have um, even Anglo-American way back. You know, we wouldn't have had those firms if it wasn't for our pensions. And these, these pensions are quite meaningful. Uh, whilst people talk about the wealth inequalities of South Africa, um, not the income inequalities, but the wealth inequalities, mm -hmm. uh, generally they don't really include pensions in that. So pensions is our biggest financial asset that mm. we have. Our biggest uh, non-financial is our houses, mm -hmm. which is also not too bad, but our pensions are really powerful. And so if you look at the pensions and you look at the people that have shares on the JSE without pensions, the pensions are 20 times that size or wow. 10 times that size. So wow. the pension funds in South Africa are really meaningful uh, in any sphere of, uh, of the imagination. It's over 300 uh, billion uh, dollars, sure. um, it, well over that. It's uh, 4.2 uh, 4 trillion rand. Mm -hmm. These are 2017 numbers. We don't have the 2018 numbers yet. So <coughs> it's a it's a large amount. It is it is really a la a large amount of money, mm. and that's enabled government to build roads because you know pensions finance government debt, um, pensions finance um, company formations, pensions finance the malls in South Africa and these days in Africa. Um, so our pensions are very, very important mm. role players in the South African economy. And then our pensioners uh, get about 7% of GDP out of uh, the pension. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's not a sm it's not as big as labor, yep. but it is quite a meaningful amount of money uh, that is spent by these pensioners who generally don't have the sort of debt levels that the working people that's have. That's right. Mike, you paint a very vivid picture as to how big the pensions, uh, can I call it industry or investments are in this country, mm -hmm. and obviously how important they are, um, not only to the individuals who uh, derive income from them, but I think from an Individual investment- Individual saving. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mike, talk to me about, I'm, I'm gonna shift a little bit, we'll come mm -hmm. back to the pensions, but talk to me about, um, because I think these two things are, are linked, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of link it later in the show. Talk to me about South Africa right now. 
the tax burden ex- experienced by the individual and the state of the economy for the individual mm-hmm. right now? Well, the tax burden in South Africa is very high. Uh, depending on how you measure it, I like measuring it without social security contributions uh, because otherwise you would have to put our pension contributions into it as well. Mm-hmm. But we have the 10th highest burden in the world at the moment. Jeepers. And it's paid by very few people. Mm. Um, so the tax burden on the people that are working is high. Mm. Uh, also due to the fact that we have so few people working because our unemployment rate is about 38%. Mm. Um, only about four out of 10 adults work in South Africa. It's a scary it's number. Is And only about six out of 10 are part of the working force or labor force. If you, if you look at it even broader, um, you know, and you compare it to the labor forces of other countries that have uh, not as high unemployment as us, but mm. they would, uh, 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 a place like China is unusual, they would have 80%, but a lot of the emerging markets are around 70%. So mm. we need to basically uh, add three quarters of the job numbers that we have right now mm. to, um, so, on. so we need to go from 16 million to uh, basically um, 32 uh, or uh, 30 uh, million people. Yep. So from 16 and a half million to 30 million people is what South Africa would have to do um, to go there. Um, the one thing about pensions that we also must remember, um, there's about 11 to 12 million people that have savings in these pensions. Yeah. Only about 1 million of them are pensioners. And as pensions you know, work... Um, uh, you know, one has to realize that the people putting in money don't always realize about returns, especially when they're younger. When they're older, they start looking at that Absolutely. pension thing every year that they get sent, and they look at it very closely. <laughs> yeah. um, back to the South African economy, I think um, right now the business cycle uh, is very negative towards us. Uh, mm-hmm. The second quarter, this quarter will be positive. I have no doubt uh, that the GDP will bounce back. Mm-hmm. But that's because we had such a bad, terrible first quarter with the load shedding. Um, but I think if you take it to the uh, third and fourth quarter, that's still not quite clear. But in South Africa at the moment, our government really is not getting the money that they need mm-hmm. from the taxation sound because the economy isn't growing. Yet they have these spending commitments. We have ESCOM to fix. So it's very likely that they're going to have a bigger budget deficit. And that budget deficit means that we're going to get more into debt because we're going to be growing our debt much, much quicker than our economy. And also our population is growing quicker Mm. than our economy. So the average person in South Africa is getting poorer. Mm. And the last, uh, let's put it this way, uh, for the seven-year period to 2020 on the current forecast, uh, nobody in South Africa, not nobody, but the average South African did not get richer. Mm. And five of those seven years would have uh, been getting poorer. Mm. So we're back to about 2011 levels now in income. Um, if something goes wrong, we could quite easily go back to 2010. Mm. Obviously, with the dip of the Great Recession, we won't go back to those sort of levels unless we have another four or five years of no uh, 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 growth lower than the population. Mm. Um, but ultimately, I think... If I compare that to the rest of the world, Mm -hmm. then we are in serious trouble. I'll tell you why I say this. Okay. Um, We used to be about 10% richer than the average person in the world in 1990. And last year, in 2018, the official World Bank figures that came out now, this week, uh, it's 76%. So, you know, we've lost out. (laughs) We should have been a lot richer. With other words, what I'm saying to you, we should be about 34% richer per person in South Africa if we did the average growth of the world. If we grew like the emerging markets, we should be a full 50-60% richer. Mm. Now, imagine a family with one car now being able to afford two cars. Yep. Or, um, <clears throat> son, how would our roads look? You know, So we'd have to build more roads. How would our taxes look? A lot better. Mm. Uh, how many uh, jobs would we have created? A lot more. Mm. So a lot of people, and I think in that sense, our inequality would have been less. Absolutely. Um, our inequality actually now is higher than it was during the last period of apartheid. Mm. If we go back to early, early periods, 1950s and so on, there's evidence that shows that South Africa was far less unequal than we are now. So that is a worry, that we are unequal, that we are not growing, that the amount of 
unemployed people are growing. It's now basically 10 million. Mm. I'm worried about South Africans in that sense. Mm. The one bright thing that we do have is our pensions. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to For that. those of us that have it. So, you know, there are bright spots, but this is a, a, a terrible thing uh, to say that we've actually got so many unemployed and poverty. And, and, and those are two things I just want to quickly just flesh out before we come back to pensions. In terms of what you've just said now, the, the one thing that I pick up as a big alarm bell is you essentially pointing to the fact that the government simply just doesn't have the revenue uh, streams anymore. <clears throat> you know, South Africans mm. are taxed to the point where, you know, and if you've spoken about the tax burden in, in, that we already face as South Africans, but that, that's it almost, is it, right? We've almost reached that weird, um, what's it called, is it the Laffer Laffer curve? curve yeah. um, where you, you can't tax people any further to get any more revenue essentially yeah, out of them. Um, that to me speaks to the psyche then that politicians go into of if they can't get money from our incomes, right? In other words, taxation, that the other source of essentially tapping into uh, or a money source is pension savings investments. Yeah. Um, and that's why I'm saying this is where prescribed assets then in terms of what we're discussing today comes in. Um, the other is the issue of inequality. Um, you know, we, we have this inequality d discussion in this country quite a lot, but really we, we almost pervert it, don't we? Mm. Inequality for me, or the real problem with our inequality isn't necessarily that, you know, there is a big gap between the rich and the poor. I don't think that's necessarily the problem. The, poor is, the problem I see it, and I'll, I'll, I'll put this to you, is that we're just not allowing poor people to in, to raise their standard of living, to raise their incomes, to build the savings, to build the investments. So that, for example, the gap, <clears throat> if there is one, is right now down here. The individual at the very bottom is just not enjoying a uh, proper standard of living for them to be called, you know, middle class or even working class. In a way, you're whereas right. Whereas it should be up here, for instance. In a way, you're right. In another way, you're wrong. Yeah. I think the way that you're right is... The, the people without jobs yeah. are the real poor. That's yeah, And they're going nowhere. If we can get them some sort of job. And I think the fact is firms need profit margins. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like profits, you will have more people unemployed because firms will not grow. That's right. Um, and that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think our education system has mm. also got a lot to blame for that. Absolutely. But I think we can uh, find a way to bring these people, and it shouldn't be these people, our poor people, mm -hmm. into the economy. Because I think our poor people must be bound into the economy in one way or another. Absolutely. And maybe that is where you know certain ideas come from, especially for the young, that you have a two- or three-year exemption period from minimum wages. Mm -hmm. You have a, a period where you then build up that experience. People can use you. Um, you get a certificate that says, I don't want the minimum wage for the, from this date onwards to there. Where, and that date can be filled in by the day you get a job because Absolutely. you're not going to get a job right away. Um, we could build up a, 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 a sort of national uh, defense force thing, but without defense, maybe mm -hmm. a national workforce where um, we use people and they learn how to build roads. It doesn't help to just chop the grass and so on, but, I mean, let's let's go for a bit of training, put people in. Yeah, apprenticeship skills, those uh, apprenticeship, artisanal uh, skills. Uh, yeah, and I think what people forget, it's not just about the actual skills. Of the, 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 the thing is that the person realizes he has to get up in the morning. Absolutely. And he has to go to job, and he has to be uh, there on time, yeah. and they have to go home at some stage, but they also have to finish something. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing that we don't always think of, and the way that we structure that would also be important. Yeah. So uh, I would say, if I was a government, I would say to people, right, um, you clean up your neighborhood, you, you know, here's the, the garbage bags. You fill them up, you bring them to us, we'll pay you so much per garbage bag mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be to start off with. And so that the society sees they get some value out of it. Um, I think those are the sort of things that we should be looking at. The other thing is I fully agree with you that once you um, got this uh, situation uh, where there is an inequality, uh, government gets nervous, and the problem that the uh, that you got is that then promises get made that yeah. cannot be kept. Yeah. 
And government thinks that everything can be solved in a magic wand called money. Yeah. Uh, money cannot solve all these things. Money cannot solve your education problem if your teachers are not good enough. Mm. Uh, money cannot save uh, people's lives if the hospitals are not clean. Mm. Um, those are the sort of basic <coughs> steps that we've got to look at. Where you are... Um, wrong? Wrong, mm -hmm. in a sense. We have a lot of people that have to understand uh, that we've got to go through a transition period. But I'm not going to blame the people on top mm. because the people on top are the people that you need. Mm -hmm. It's that sort of labor union people that don't realize that they're part of the rich too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to tell them, well, yes, your 10,000 or 12,000 rand actually puts you into the richer fifth mm -hmm. of the South African population, if not into the richest 10%. Mm -hmm you have to start realizing where you are. Mm -hmm. And that realization, I don't think, is always there. So the guy will say, talk on behalf of the working class, uh, but ultimately they are, in South African terms, and sometimes even in world terms, not really working class. Mm -hmm. They are, in fact, now middle class to richer or upper middle class. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is part of the problem. So we have, um, I'll use a dumb example that I saw in a news bulletin once where uh, teachers were saying they're the poorest of the poor during mm. a strike period. Um, I saw <laughs> judges uh, 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 and ma or magistrates rather uh, say the same thing. Mm. I've seen people when they go on strike say these things all the time. It seems to be the modernity. No, that's the refrain. That's the refrain. Mm. The problem is when you've only got four out of ten people working and <laughs> three out of ten people working in the formal sector who then can strike, mm. if you wish, because the only people in South Africa that can strike are the rich. Absolutely. The richest third. Um, then, it, then, it, then it becomes clear that the misunderstanding, um, which is what you're trying to counter, mm -hmm. is very important that we replace that um, misunderstanding with the facts. And that is very, very important. So when you look at South African car ownership, for example, um, one third of our households have a car. That is the richer third. Yes. And we've got to tell people that. And not necessarily that you have to have a car to be rich, but when you, you know, got a formal house to stay in, a car, cell phones, a few gadgets and a fridge and mm -hmm. everything like that, you're pretty much middle class in mm. South Africa, sorry. And uh, 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 we have a, about 60% of our people, 70% of our, uh, stay in a, in, a, in a sort of brick or formal house. So that's just one part of it. You've got to look at a multi-factor thing. And it's very difficult to pinpoint it. But I think the problem is that we've thought ourselves poor. Mm -hmm. Everybody believes they're poor. Everybody in mm -hmm. South Africa is a victim. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a victim. You know, I'm, I'm a victim uh, because the, the taxi uh, stopped in front of me <laughs> and uh, uh, without warning. And, you know, now I'm victimized. <laughs> um, but it's South Africa. South Africa is a victim. And, and for me, Mike, it, it comes back to, and this will be the last cast because I want us to come, come back to the issue of prescribed assets and really the attack on people's savings mm -hmm. and investments. Um, you know, we, we live in a country where we, we outsource our success to someone else. So I, I speak as a black South African here, and I see this amongst my peers in particular. <clears throat> you know, here we are, we've worked hard. We've been given every opportunity by our parents to get a better mm. education, etc. By the way, parents who save and scrimp to put um, their children through absolutely. school, yeah. you know, often at, at, at you know great challenges. You know, I have parents. All parents do that. All absolutely. all parents. <clears throat> you know, so um, and, and you know, you then have peers like you know, uh, very successful, high up in the corporate world, entrepreneurs, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, but they'll always attribute that, that success, their success, to someone else. So they'll say, "Oh no, government did this. If it wasn't for government, I would not be here." Now, they're very. If we look at the data, the, the very male, well, mm. very well, maybe an element of truth in that, but we, we it's this weird thing we do where we, we just, we don't recognize the individual, the idea that actually it was through mm. our knowledge, skills, and abilities, our, our in, in, in initiative, 
that we're able to build uh, the sort of standard of living that we now enjoy. Um, so that the real inequality, because that's where we began, the real inequality for me is that chap who lives on a... Uh, sand dune in Cape Town in a shack who actually is very poor doesn't mm. have the opportunity job. and doesn't have the job which brings in the income which allows him to build savings mm. and by sa- savings I mean household savings and from those household savings he or she is able to buy better mm. options for their family a better a- education better health care mm. etc et that is the real inequality in this country it's us who work and you know even if the, the pay is meager are able to build savings mm. from that versus the uh, you know, millions of South Africans who are unemployed and really uh, find it very difficult to be employed. Um, so that the point I was making early on, and I'll let you comment on this, the point I was making early on, on inequality is actually, I don't mind there being an, an unequal society. For instance, Patrice Motepe is a multi-billionaire. He's much more richer than I am. However, I also, I also earn a very good income. Mm. So that the inequality between him and I is up here, where my income is also very high. I, I enjoy a very nice standard of living. But the real problem, I think, um, is that there's inequality between me um, and those like me, people who are employed, and those who are unemployed. Um, yeah. If we can address that so that their standard that, of that living is, that is, rises. That is exactly what I feel. Yeah. I, I feel if you, there's, there's other, uh, I can't remember what it's called, it's not a Guinea coefficient, the Palmer um, thing. If you look at most countries, those that are in the, uh, from 40th to 90th, they very much earn the same sort of income of a, a percentage income right through the world. Mm. There's 8% difference or 10% difference, mm. but it's not huge. The top 10% is where the big difference and the bottom 40%. Mm. So in South Africa, it's the real problem is the bottom 40% Absolutely. that don't have an income. And we've got to find a way to do that. Uh, profits are very necessary, so Absolutely. we want Patrick to make a lot of money so that he can feel he's got the confidence to build more firms. And to invest, absolutely. And to invest. And, 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 and once he's finished the bank, he should have an insurance house. And once he's got the insurance house, he should have the TV station. And once he's got the TV station, you know, he should have the road building company. Mm. That's what I want Patrick to do. Mm-hmm. Patrick will bring up a lot of us absolutely. into that process. Or that sort of pro- and 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 people forget that that profit motive mm. is very important. Absolutely, but only very few people act on it. Mm. So in South Africa, two percent of adults are employers. Mm. In most other countries, it's double or more than that. Mm. So if we can get that profit motive, and we can get four, five, six percent of people to be employers, not talking about self-employed, yep. employing others, yep. Yep. then that will make a big difference. You know, in South Africa, the situation is so desperate. Um, People collect uh, and uh, your garbage, absolutely, um, uh, 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 free of charge. Actually, and uh, they just go through it, and they in every suburb in in South Africa these days, virtually, and uh, uh, they sell that on. People buy spaces at robots to go and beg money. Mm. People pay f- to be a car guard. Mm. People pay to be a hairdresser. Uh, uh, the rent they they have to uh, partake in the mm. rent. They uh, they don't they don't have a minimum wage. Mm. Which for me bursts the myth of the of the lazy South African. You know, people yeah, will do anything and everything for I, the benefit uh, of an income and family. I think a lot of South Africans are not lazy. Absolutely. There's no doubt. That, look, every country has lazy people. Yes. Every uh, 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 and we all go through periods where you know you get at home at night, you're tired, the kids have driven you crazy. You know, you 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 have to rest sometimes, mm-hmm. but. There is a, a, a time and a place for that. Yeah. And there are people in South Africa that work very long hours, very hard, and they do it for very little. Absolutely. Mike, speaking about very little, um, <clears throat> there is very little the state can do right now to raise more revenue by way of further taxation. This is now a fact, mm. essentially, and I think the ANC realized this. Hence, in their recent, um, in the, just, we've just come from an election, and obviously political parties put out their manifestos, mm. and two parties in particular had a, a prescription in their manifesto, excuse the pun, um, suggesting that or mooting prescribed assets. Now, Mike, very briefly, what is a prescribed asset or prescribed assets, and okay. why is this a problem two, for two, two things. Uh, Prescribed asset can be called a prudential asset, which we have already in South Africa. So there you say to people, 25% has got to be in interest-bearing uh, 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 instruments. And you know that the government is going to be the main uh, beneficiary of Absolutely. that because they – so on. But that's a softer one because you can still decide between which governments and 
and so on. Then you can go to a harder prescribed assets, which we used to have. We must forget that. In the mid-80s, 53% of your assets were prescribed yeah. in very specific terms, either municipal bonds, government bonds, or ESCOM bonds. Essentially, the apartheid government was stealing from pensioners in yeah. order to prop up exactly. various Exactly, and... and, 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 and uh, uh, the Transcend Pension Fund yeah. stole from its own pensioners, yeah. if you wish. Uh, it's probably the same in, in the Municipal Pension Fund days. Um, I think it was the Benoni Municipal Pension Fund where, you know, they um, they tried to hide losses and they oh. bought crazy things like maize futures and so on. But the point is they yeah. had to do crazy things because they used their employees' money for their own uh, stuff, which didn't work out. So we have a lot of examples here in South Africa, mm -hmm. which says to you that prescribed assets or where people uh, you misuse pension assets can make people poor. Mm -hmm. And it's at that stage where you cannot work. Um, when you're 75 or 70 or whatever the case may be, you have the right to be lazy. Mm -hmm. You have the right to. You've oh, earned you your. Earned you, yeah. <laughs> you've earned your thing. You've saved your money. Yeah. You know, and and now all of a sudden you have to stay in your kid's garage if you're lucky that your kids are not still here, yeah. or you your kids have a house. Uh, you know, uh, because your house is now taken. You've had to spend all that money. You've given up, and, so on, and you've got nothing, no wealth to transfer to your kids. And we also know that that is also an important part that pensions also do. That's right. Is son, and especially in a world that's aging, you know, South Africa, we see young people zero years old are growing at one point four percent a year. Mm -hmm. At sixty years old, we're growing at three point four percent a year. Mm. So, our population, like the rest of the world, mm -hmm. is rapidly aging, mm. and those prescribed assets when they are misused, which they will be, because mm -hmm. we've seen from the PIC uh, inquiry uh, right now uh, how that money gets misused. Mm -hmm. And now, and we must remember, that's not government's pension. That's government employees' pension fund. That's people's that's, savings. That's people's savings. Absolutely. Not, that gets not the lost government. in the jargon, yeah. Yeah, don't get lost in the jargon. Yeah. That savings are for, for, for the people that work for government. Mm. And whether I agree with the people working for government or whether mm. I disagree with them, it's their savings. It's not That's my right. right or anybody else's right, That's right to misuse that money. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this stuff is getting misused in all sorts of names, in the name of BEE, mm. in the name of development, in the name of this, in the name of that. I think pensions need to work on risk and reward. Those are the only two criteria that in the bigger picture play a role. Obviously, it depends on the age of your uh, pensioners mm -hmm. that you have. The older they get, the more you'll probably put into uh, interest-bearing sort That's of savings right. That's right. Uh, and less into equity. The younger they are, more equity, more private equity growth. maybe, in, so more growth. But ultimately, uh, you know, that's where we are at the moment. Mike, let me, let me take a step back. Just for the benefit of viewers who aren't maybe fully, fully, fully ingratiated on this issue, prescribed assets... It's in the ANC's manifesto. Essentially, at a definitional level, it is the government giving itself the right, if you will, yeah. to essentially um, direct your fund manager, the person who keeps your savings, to um, wherever they want your the money. money. Um, so and for it instance, doesn't matter on the returns. They yeah. could say, right, you have to put it into government bonds. Because and this can include things like ESCOM. Um, yeah. And ESCOM has a very big chance of going bust. Yeah. Or uh, let's go to SAA. 20 billion or more was used to fund SAA. Genius. In a prescribed asset way, we could have said, okay, you fund SAA. But if you look under the carpet, there's nothing to sell at SAA mm. if your things go wrong because they've only got three aircraft that are theirs and they're very old. The rest mm. are all leased. Least, yeah. So you can't sell them. Uh, it's not really developmental in the sense of South Africans because you could argue a bit for the tourism show, but you could also then say it's much easier just to have other airlines fly Absolutely. in here and it doesn't cost you a, a cent. Um, so I think that's where uh, uh, the situation comes from, where government prescribes where it goes. And what we also then saw is that the rewards uh, didn't reflect the risk. Mm. So you had a situation where ESCOM uh, bonds would have been priced at a higher yield or a municipality bond at a higher yield. And uh, that would have, if something went wrong, you would have had a lot more of your money uh, back over time because the, the uh, son and uh, the, 
you know, you've, it's a risk reward situation that yeah. then gets destroyed because government then directs it and says, you will put 20% into government bonds, you will put 10% into ESCOM, you'll put 5% into municipalities, you'll put 10% into the Development Bank of mm, Africa, mm. and, you know, another 3% into Cecil or whatever the case may be. And, and it can be get, uh, as prescriptive as that. Uh, and, Mike, this is where I think, and we said this earlier on, the link comes in now. You know, you have your politician, uh, looks at the situation, cannot raise <coughs> any more income mm. through taxation, looks at the uh, pension funds, which you er- early on said are now oh, it's a you know, very the pile. It's biggest a pile in the of world. Money. Um, it's the individual, though, who suffers, isn't it? Because yes. here you are, a working individual. I'm 32 this year. I work uh, hard. I, I save money. I do the right things, right, as the individual. So I save my money every month. I look after my family. I pay off the house, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I'm expecting that when I turn 65, there will be a pot of money that I can then not only live off of, and be off the state's books because yeah. I won't have to be a state recipient of a grant, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And you'd be able to buy a plane ticket or train ticket to watch the grandchildren play Absolutely. Uh, in, in their little league, uh, baseball or and, whatever. And the point you were making, which is a very important one, is when I then pass away, there'll still be a little bit of something that I can pass on to my kids. Yes. It is that individual who gets screwed over, isn't it? It's every individual. It's you as the old person because now – you don't have the money. I mean, I know of cases. I used to work at Transnet just as background. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not mentioning names, and I can't remember okay. all the names anyway. But a lot of the people I know at Transnet that are older than me are living in garages of their children. That's a shame. That's and a shame. they have no money. They are getting so little money out that that basically they, their medical aid is all because that gets taken off first. Mm. And then they get paid out to Rand just to let them know that there is something there for them mm. and that the bank account can carry on running. And, uh, you know, if you look at that, yes, um, mm. because the <laughs> Transcend Medical Aid had some money put into it for this. But the point of the matter is, um, other than the medical aid, they have to live off their children. They have no food. I mean, you, you've got to eat. Mm. You, 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 mm. you may have to go and see the doctor, mm. but you've got to eat. Um you know, you've got to have a roof over your head. Mm. And these are people that worked 40, 42 years. Um, you know, the, we're not talking about people who uh, skim the, uh, 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 quickly and uh, 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 got a nice cushy job. Yeah. We're talking about train drivers. We're yeah. talking about people who were conductors. We're talking about people working in offices. Again, the point being people who did the right thing. They saved, yes. they put money aside. And it was enforced and on did them. The, exactly. And did they, uh, you know, the understanding that there'll be something at the yeah. end that looks after it's them. So 15% of your salary mm. uh, went into your pension mm. every month. Um, you could buy a bit of pension back, which is a bit of a ruse as well. I think that was one of the problems I had, but that's neither here nor there. So many people did that. And uh, you couldn't touch your pension. If you left in the first 13 years, you only got 3%. And remember, in those days, inflation was 15% or 12%. So getting 3% a year back was actually stealing from you anyway. Mm. But they, the idea was, they said, you will get your salary when you go on pension, and it will be increased as with the other people. Same as the state gets now. But when the money wasn't there, they couldn't do that. So then they increased the people's uh, pension with 2%. Now, 2% over a period of 20 years, <laughs> and you've got an average of 6% inflation, makes people poorer very, Absolutely. very quickly. And ultimately, you know, you, you found a lot of people. I mean, I'm not quite sure what the numbers were, but there were something like 90,000 people mm. that were in this boat. And now only about 45,000 of them are left. They're going to get paid something out, hopefully now with a deal that was struck. The problem is if we go and we do the same with the other 11 to 12 million people in Mm. South Africa, that's a huge amount of people that will be in trouble. Now we're looking at just private pensioners in South Africa at the moment are around a million. Not all of them. The average pension that they get out is just over 7,000 rand, Mm 7,500 rand, I would say. Um, The median pension is probably about 5,500. That's a typical one. Um, so some of them still draw on the state because you're allowed to, I think, get uh, 4,000 rand and still get part of your old age grant mm-hmm. or four and a half. I'm mm-hmm. not quite sure mm-hmm. where. So yes, the state's already helping. But now if you take this 
then the other stuff goes up because the state will have to find even more money to spend because That's now right. you're social welfare spending. And we know that the old age pensioners are growing at 3.4% mm. a year. So this is actually the people that have done the right thing. Mm. And then at the sort of thing where people have houses, 1,500 rand is not going to even pay your municipal fees. Mm. It's not going to pay your medical aid. Mm -hmm. It's not going to pay a lot of things. So the prescribed assets is a very dangerous thing for people. And I think the problem is that the younger people don't always n realize it because they're still far away from pension, so mm. they don't think about pension. Uh, the positive is I think a lot of the trade unions today are mm. starting to realize it. Um, I spoke the other day to two or three other people who were all in the trade union. They actually phoned and wanted to meet with me about this. Um, a bit off the record uh, in a sense because they they need to f do their work first. Mm. But ultimately I think there's a, there's a big fight coming mm. because we realize that government – uh, is two-faced about it. They'll say, no, no, it's not really prescribed. And then the one guy will say, well, it's about coal assets. And the next guy will say, it's this, about the motor industry. Um, ultimately, I think um, they are playing a very careful game. And we've got to be very awake to the this because it could impoverish all of us in our old age. Mm. And that's what not what we want. We want more jobs. We want people to be able to feel that they can save. If we save that, I think the money will probably be better spent very often uh, in an open market where mm. capital can help make that decision which company to fund <coughs> or which bond to fund. Um, I mean, you know, I might not like uh, the GFIB, but uh, Sanrel was a good bond for many years and you knew that you got a different return as well because roads were being built. Mm -hmm. But those roads and those toll roads paid you back. And worldwide, that's an accepted uh, 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 method that you would have some, or utility like ESCOM. What's gone wrong at ESCOM, however, is that the transparency wasn't good enough mm. and a lot of wrongs happened. Now, under prescribed assets, getting back to that, mm -hmm. uh, if those transparencies aren't there, or even if they are there, you have no choice. Mm. You have to invest there. So it is a very dangerous uh, uh, thing for us to play at the moment, especially where um, there's been so many examples of crooks in the system. Absolutely. Mike, um, I think you raise a very scary scenario and a very realistic one. And I think it's one which South Africans need to be aware of, especially because it's hidden behind these wonderful terms, right? Which, you know, uh, it's jargon, as, as I began the show by saying, you know, prescribed assets. And very little people will know what that means. But now we do know what it means. It essentially means politicians digging into your savings, your investments by way of your pensions in order to decide where that money goes and often paying for things that don't have the sort of return that the market would offer over time. Exactly. So your ESCOM, for example, your... Um, and expose you to a huge risk where things can go wrong. Absolutely. Um, Mike, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hopefully we'll have you back on the Big Liberty Show. Thank you so much for joining us. Great pleasure being here. Awesome. Thanks, man. Um, and thank you for joining us on this episode of the Big Liberty Show. I hope you learned something. I definitely did. And, um, you know... We say this all the time on the show. We need to become a society where the individual, and really, as classical liberals, we talk about the individual a lot. Really, we're a family society. We need to become a society where the family is given every opportunity to prosper so that people, decision makers within the family level, the mom, the dad, um, the gogo -go in the household, becomes the individual who makes decisions around how best to access education, safety, security, um, welfare, all these issues that speak to our individual prosperity. And you cannot have a property-owning and prosperous society when you have a predatory elite, if you will, of politicians looking to fleece you of not only income, but also savings and investments, such as policies like expropriation without compensation, which ta attacks your property rights, or even prescribed assets, which again, also attacks your property rights, because your pension is your property, it's your money, it's your savings. Um, so I want you guys to be very attuned to this, but don't feel a sense of despair, because 
is I'm looking to each and every single one of you who may have watched the show to actually join us here at the Institute of Race Relations in the Fight. We have a campaign that we've launched um, where if you go to our website, irr.org.za, um, under the pensions section, we have a petition there where you can sign up and you can tell your fund manager um, to firstly, on the one hand, explain exactly what um, the effect of uh, such a, a policy like prescribed assets will have on your funds and also for them to be allowed a voice in fighting back. Um, you know, if we don't do anything as individuals, if we don't do anything in society, then you allow the predatory politician to dig more and more into your income and into your savings. So guys, join that campaign, find it on our IRR website, as I said, irr.org.za forward slash or rather under the pension section where you can tell your fund manager to get into the fight and to fight back against a bad policy proposal like prescribed assets. And as usual, support us, support Big Daddy Liberty, support the Big Liberty Show and support the Institute of Race Relations in our fight against these sort of bad ideas, period, by becoming a friend of the IRR. This is our crowdfunding campaign and essentially, it's thousands of South Africans, people like you and me, um, who put aside between 70 and 90 rand a month towards funding the work that we do here, the advocacy work and the, um, the lobbying work that we do here. And you can do this, as I said, by becoming a friend of the IRR. You, you just simply SMS your name to 32823. An SMS will cost you one rand. Terms and conditions to apply. Or, hey... Maybe you're thinking SMSs, what are those? I'm a millennial, um, you know, I'm new, I'm hip. Well, then find us online at irr.org.za forward slash join and you can sign up a monthly debit order there. Guys, thank you so much for joining me on the Big Liberty Show. Um, you can look forward to other episodes coming up, including some vlogs and the Blacks Only Show, which will premiere uh, or rather a new episode will come out this Sunday. Guys, thank you so much. I will see you on the next show.